Matthew Stinchcomb is the executive director of the Good Work Institute. Uh, his impressive bio can be found in your program. He's not around. So, so why don't T-Rexes wear socks? They're extinct. Is Matthew ready? We're good. <laughs> Matthew's impressive bio can be found in your program. Uh, the mission of the Good Work Institute is to educate and connect a network of local community members and actively support their collaborative efforts uh, to regenerate their respective places. Uh, this couldn't be more true for what we're trying to achieve tonight. Uh, so please help me give Matt Stinchcomb a warm welcome. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's really great to be here tonight and um, really inspiring to see all of those pitches. Um, I would argue that you need all of those things. Uh, so please support them in any ways that you can, regardless of who wins tonight. Um, they're all really important. And um, I also had the great opportunity to uh, get a tour of York today and uh, meet a lot of uh, community members and meet the mayor and just see what's happening here. And what an amazing place, I have to say. It's incredibly beautiful. And there's just so much happening here. So, you know, whatever you're doing, don't stop uh, because it's great. Um, so I'm going to, and also, also want to thank the Community Foundation uh, for, for bringing me here tonight and, and um, being so, so gracious and so welcoming. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my story and how it relates to what I'm, what I'm seeing here today because my journey has been kind of an unusual one. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how uh, Etsy came about, the online marketplace for uh, handmade and vintage goods, uh, and then talk about what we're working on now. Um, and hopefully, there'll be a little bit of time in case there's questions at the end, because that's always the most interesting part, so I can hear what you, you can tell me what you actually want to hear about, uh, rather than me just talking. So, um, I always like to start these presentations with a picture of this. Uh, this is a handmade wooden computer. Um, this is actually the product that launched Etsy.com. So are you all familiar with Etsy? Yeah. Okay, so um, Etsy is an online marketplace where um, independent creative producers can sell the things that they make. And um, back in 2005, uh, I was living in Brooklyn, New York, and I uh, was a professional musician in a touring rock band. And, uh, you know, was not really getting along with my bandmate, was getting tired of touring and, um, you know, decided I wanted to get off the road. And, uh, my roommate at the time was a guy named Rob Kalin. And I was also living with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. Uh, but the three of us were living in this apartment in Brooklyn. And Rob was making these handmade wooden computers. Um, Rob had just graduated from NYU, which was his fifth college. Uh, he finally finished there. He was maybe 20 four or 23 years old. Uh, I was the, the old person at 29 at the time. And uh, Rob made these computers, and he sold uh, three of them to a bagel shop in our neighborhood. And he said, wow, there's a market for these computers. And each one was made by hand. He had the wood shop in his bedroom. Uh, he did all of the you know, electronic soldering and putting all those things together. And he said, you know, I think I'm going to try to sell these. And so he went to put them online and went to eBay. And eBay was just people you know, selling old CDs and sneakers and things that they didn't want anymore. And he said, these things take me hundreds of hours. I don't want to put it on eBay. I'm going to make my own website. And uh, he started to think about building his own website, but realized that everybody he knew was making something, that there was this emergent maker movement that was happening. And so he said, ah, I'm going to make a website for everybody that makes things. Uh, and that was Etsy. Um, and that's, that's what it looked like. It took him about three months to build it. He um, connected with two developers uh, that he met at NYU, and they built this first version of the site. I remember when he was working on it, um, you know, he was, there wasn't that this was a product of like, well, I've done some market analysis, and I think the uh, craft and hobby sector is ripe for disruption. It was really just actually, how do I make a place for people who are making things? And um, the basic business model has not changed, really, from the first day. Uh, Etsy charges 20 cents to list an item for four months. When that item sells, Etsy takes 3.5% commission. Um, except for that first month, back in June 2005, it hasn't changed since that day. 
And I remember uh, when Rob was you know, coming up with the idea, he, he asked me how much it costs to sell something on eBay. And I said, I think they take like 4%. He's like, we'll be 3.5%. Like, and that, that, was the, that was the calculated financial you know, idea behind Etsy. Um, so Etsy has uh, grown a lot um, since those first days. And so anyways, at the time, um, as I mentioned, I, I wanted to get out of the music business, and um, Rob and I had had a little screen printing business in Brooklyn, so he's like, why don't you just come and work on this Etsy thing with me? And I was like, well, I'm not a programmer, you know, what, what, what would I do? He's like, you can be the marketing guy. And I'm like, I don't know anything about marketing. He's like, perfect. Uh, and so, you know, in a way, I think that was kind of perfect, because I very much had a beginner's mind uh, when it came to business, I think we all did. We weren't coming out of the business world in any formal way. We were just really operating from a place that felt right and felt intuitive to us. Um, but here's the first marketing for Etsy, uh, showing off my digital marketing chops by hand screen printing posters and sticking them up around town. Um, I was like, I know how to screen print. Let's start there. Uh, so I love this because uh, it very much captures the sentiment uh, at the beginning of Etsy. So it's a kid throwing a rock at a factory. Uh, and we really saw Etsy as this kind of subversive thing where we could say, hey, look, let's actually provide alternatives to all these mass-produced goods that are being made in sweatshops or where there's no uh, social or ecological accountability for the, how they're being produced. Let's take 96.5% of the money and give it to the people who are making things rather than giving them a couple pennies to produce a thing. Uh, and so that was very much the founding ethos of Etsy. Um, so this is uh, a funny picture, that, uh, funny to me, maybe not to you, but this was very much my life for many years. I was uh, telling the group of people with whom I was meeting earlier today that you know, uh, I wanted to stop touring. With, that was one of my main reasons for stopping being in a band. And I immediately just went on tour for Etsy, just going town to town to try to you know, basically uh, promote Etsy, but really to actually try to build community. And that was very much our approach from the first day, you know, the little bit that I did learn about marketing, um, the less I wanted to do it that way. You know, we had a very small, small amount of money as it was, and I thought the least creative thing we could do would be to spend it on advertising. Uh, and this was really before Facebook or any of those, you know, uh, social media marketing or, or search engine optimization. And none of that stuff existed at this point. So, you know, we could have taken out an ad or in a, in a magazine or something like that. And I said, well, why don't we use that money and instead figure out how to support our community with it? And so we created a whole bunch of innovative programs that actually uh, was aimed at supporting the community, not us. And by extension, when they were successful, we became successful. Um, but this is what marketing at Etsy looked like. So this picture is actually um, taken, uh, I think, in maybe 2010 or 11. This is in Finland. Uh, but at the time, you know, our first meetup was in Brooklyn, and then, you know, we went maybe to, I don't know, D.C. It's like, it, it just kind of grew out of that. And um, I love this picture because every meetup was like this. It was, it was always, here, here I am in the center, and then like 60 women, and then there are like three angry boyfriends in the back. <laughs> and, and, and they weren't angry because I was there, they were angry because they were there, you know. And... Uh, but that's what it was like. And, and people were always shocked that the you know, five people uh, behind Etsy at the beginning were all, were all men. Uh, because Etsy, uh, to this day, is, is predominantly driven by, by women, um, at least the people using the marketplace, and in the company, too. Um, so uh, this is a photograph from the Etsy labs in Brooklyn. So when we finally got our first office in 2006, um, it was actually pretty funny. We had the screen printing business still going at the same time, and we're like, we're not, we're not sure which one's gonna be better. Um, you know, like, we, we just got a t-shirt order for 30 t-shirts, you know. Um, but uh, when we finally got our first office, we still had the screen printing shop, so we didn't know what to do with it, so we decided to move it to the office. And uh, we had way more space than we needed. There was only um, six people at the company at this point, and um, three of them weren't local. So it was really only three of us that were going to be in this office at first. Uh, and so anyways, we tried to figure out what should we do with this space. And we said, ah, let's, let's make it a space for our community. So we created something called the Etsy Labs, where we just invited all of the makers in to come in and make things. We moved the screen printing shop there. 
Uh, we got a letter press, we got a whole bunch of sewing machines, and we just created this maker space that was really just about building that community around what we were doing. Um, this is the Etsy Labs in Berlin, Germany. So uh, by 2010, I'd moved over to Germany and was, was getting Etsy going outside of the United States. And we took the same approach, really, how do we just build community and support the artists and the people that are uh, using our platform, knowing, again, that if they're successful, we're successful. Uh, and so that was very much the approach that we took. Um, here's a quick snapshot of the amount of goods sold on Etsy. Um, so that first year, uh, about 200, that's a half a year, $200,000 worth of goods, which I remember just being shocked by. Like, I can't believe $200,000 worth of goods. Uh, last year, it was about $3.2 billion um, worth of goods sold on Etsy. Thanks. Um, uh, obviously, very important to note that that is not the money Etsy makes. That's the business, the volume of the small businesses that are using Etsy. And, and that's actually what's, what's really important. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, as we think about how to build businesses that actually give back more than they take, it's important to remember, at least from a financial point of view, Etsy creates a lot more value than it's taking from the world for the small businesses that are there. And I think that that's right. I think that that's the way we need to be thinking uh, if we're actually going to survive <laughs> as a species. Uh, so yes, I think this is really a testament to um, all of the hard work that, that people put into their, to their shops on Etsy. And, um, I don't have the most uh, up-to-date figures, um, but uh, it's also worth noting that uh, of the 1.7 or 1.9 million businesses that are on Etsy, about 80% of them are run by women. Um, about 50%, at least last time I knew, um, were basically living around the poverty level, and about 19% of them were making a living full-time with their art. So it is an important um, economic avenue for a lot of people. Um, fast forward to, uh, I mentioned in 2010, uh, I moved over to Germany. Um, this is an image from the first Etsy conference that we ever put on. It was called Hello Etsy. And I bring this up because to me it really marks uh, an important uh, moment in Etsy's evolution. So um, back in 2007, uh, Etsy was two years old or so. We decided to read um, a book. Uh, we started a company book club. I think there was maybe 20 of us or something at the time. And the first book we read was Deep Economy by Bill McKibben. I highly recommend that book. It's, uh, I think, from 2007. So it's a little out of date now. But to me, it was really the first time I started really reading about what, what a local living economy looks like. What does it really look like to have a vibrant local economy? And to me, it was really, really informative uh, because it started um, me thinking a lot about you know, what's wrong with, with our economy now, uh, what's not working, and how do we begin to foster thing, uh, something? And this is what we talked about today, too, and something that I saw very much in York in, in just the short time I've been here, foster a community or economy that's based on a big number of small things rather than a small number of very big things. Lots of local ownership, independent, non-chain, really you know, mutualistic, supporting communities where you're actually connected to the people uh, with whom you're interacting. And I saw the same thing, be it on a, a virtual scale on at Etsy, you know, it was a big number of small things that were interacting and they were putting the human first, right? You actually had a relationship with the people who were providing the goods and services in your life. Um, so that really uh, sparked me uh, to continue down this interesting path uh, where I started getting into people like E.F. Schumacher, who wrote Small is Beautiful back in 1972, uh, Danello Meadows, who wrote The Limits to Growth, and becoming more and more convinced that the system that we have is completely unsustainable. And now more than ever, I feel that is the case. And more than ever, I feel like we actually need to do things that are radically different. Not necessarily radically new, just radically different than the course that we're on now. Really ones that are based in relationship and based in trust and based in place, based in community. Um, so uh, one of the speakers at this, oh yeah, so I, I put this picture up because um, by the time we finally held our first big Etsy event, everyone's like, when are you going to put on an Etsy craft fair? And you're like, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it. And finally, finally we put on a fair, it was actually just about local economics. 
because uh, that's where, where our head was. And, and one of the speakers uh, at our event, uh, you guys know who this is? She's, she's from Pennsylvania. That's right, Judy Wicks. Yeah, uh, so Judy Wicks was one of the speakers uh, at, at that first Etsy event. And she was, is uh, a good friend and inspiration. Um, she ran the White Dog Cafe in Philly. And you know, she's someone to me who was modeling a t totally different idea of what success looked like. As her business grew, there were lots of opportunities to franchise, to scale, to open mo multiple locations. And instead, she said, no, I just want to go deeper into my place. I want to pay my employees more. I want to support more local farms. I want to actually root myself more deeply so that the more successful I am, the more successful my place is. Uh, and she's been really, uh, I think she's lived that her whole life. Um, there's a story of, of Judy uh, that I love where she, she wrote a book called Good Morning Beautiful Business, which I highly recommend any entrepreneur reads. I think it's uh, one of the best business books out there. Um, another one is Instructions to the Cook by Bernie Glassman, who started the um, Grayston Bakery in Yonkers. Um, but Judy tells a story about how when uh, she had the white dog, you know, they were, one of their most popular things was bacon. And she finally learned about factory farming and she ran into the kitchen. She said, immediately take bacon off the menu. Like, we can't serve this until she could find actually a, a sustainable, humane, and local source of bacon. So she ultimately, well, well before there was any sort of um, real farm to table movement, she went ingredient by ingredient at the White Dog and figured out how to support her local community through what she was purchasing. Um, now, what's beautiful about that story is not that she did that. The next thing that she did is she went to all of her competitors and gave her, her list of all her suppliers and said, you should be supporting these people too. And that to me is like, that's the key shift, right? Where she's actually saying, this is you know, information that I have that could give me a competitive advantage. But she's, you know, instead of thinking about competition, she thinks about collaboration and she thinks about the good of the whole. And that's you know, when I think about um, the social, ecological, and economic challenges that we're facing, like that's the consciousness shift that it's gonna take for all of us you know, to recognize that our successes are shared, that you're, if your neighbor isn't successful, you're not successful. If you know, your rivers and your mountains and your farms aren't successful, you're not successful. Really beginning to shift to recognizing our, our interdependence with one another. Um, and I think that that's uh, really, you know, the, the, something that Judy has embodied and, and uh, really lived her whole life. Um, so cut to uh, 2012. Uh, I've been living over in Europe, uh, getting Etsy going overseas, which was also a really interesting experience and um, happy to talk about some of the lessons I learned doing that. I guess the main one that I'll mention since I'm on the topic is that each place is particular and uh, what works in one place may not work in another place. So you really need to work in a way that knows and honors all the people in that place. So as I think about all of these projects that we're seeing tonight, they clearly do that. They, they not only know, they honor the people and they honor their place. And that's how something will be successful. Um, Chad, who had, was at this point was the CEO of Etsy, um, asked me to move back to Brooklyn take over marketing, community, and communications again. Uh, at this point, Etsy was maybe a four or 500 person company. Uh, I had 48 people on the marketing team, um, which felt shocking to me. Um, and it really was about like, well, here's the uh, SEM report. And I would just like, my eyes would glaze over. And I'm like, I, I believe you that you know what you're doing, but like, I can't get excited about this. I'm really sorry. I'm trying really hard. Like, <laughs> just tell me what you need and let me help you be successful. But so I, I came back and I did this job for about um, eight months. And at this point, I'd, I'd, I had my first kid already um, and maybe already, not, not quite yet the next one on the way, but I had my first son, um, moved back to Brooklyn. And I wrote a letter to Chad saying, you know, um, I don't want to do this. Like, I, I can't do this. I don't want this job. I'm not feeling called to this. And, um, I had rewritten Etsy's mission at this point to reimagine commerce in ways that build a more fulfilling and lasting world. I'll tell you a little bit about what we meant by that in a minute. 
Um, but I realized that I was feeling very called to something different. And um, back when I had my first son, and you know, just as it is for a lot of people, it got me thinking about, well, why am I here? What am I being called to do in the world? What's my purpose? And I knew that my, I'm here to make the world better than it would be were I not, were I not here. And I wanted to figure out how to do that in everything that I did. Um, and so I started thinking about, well, how can I most effectively do that given you know, where I am and who I am right now? And I started thinking about, well, maybe I'll start a nonprofit organization or maybe I'll run for office or I don't know what I'm gonna do. Uh, and then I realized I'm, like, I'm never gonna have the opportunity that I've just kind of lucked into with Etsy to be able to actually be a member of the executive team and have a say in decisions that are made uh, and to have a platform through which we can reach so many people. And so I wrote to Chad and I said, I want my job to be about maximizing the impact that Etsy can have. Uh, and much to my shock, he said, okay. And then I was like, oh shit, now I have no idea what I'm gonna do. <laughs> like, just like marketing, I was telling uh, some people earlier today that um, the reason that I got interested and in, in, in started learning about business as conventionally practiced, business as usual, was because I didn't know what I was doing and I was afraid they were gonna catch me. That, like, that the board was gonna find out that I didn't know what I was gonna do and fire me. Uh, so I secretly taught myself business and the more I learned, I'm like, I don't wanna do it like that. That seems crazy. Um, so anyways, I've had a very unconventional, uh, self-directed business education. Um, but uh, so I wanted to you know, really focus on using business as an engine for impact, kind of like Judy Wicks had talked about. How can business be beautiful? Um, and what does beautiful business look like? Um, so uh, that became my new job. I started a team called Values and Impact at Etsy. One of the first things that we did um, was uh, undergo the process of becoming a B Corp. Um, do you all know about benefit corporations at all, a little bit? Um, well, I, I wanted to put this in here just for the businesses that we're um, presenting tonight. Um, they're, actually, they also came out of Pennsylvania, right? Yeah. Yay, yay Pennsylvania, guys, come on. <laughs> um, so um, B Corps, uh, just very quickly, uh, it's kind of like fair trade or organic, but it's a certification for business. Um, so you undergo a rigorous third party assessment uh, where they look at your social, ecological, economic, and governance practices. And if you get a score of 80 and above, you can become a certified B Corp. There's also something called a benefit corporation, which is a corporate structure. So S Corp, C Corp, this is a B Corp, benefit corporation. And it actually builds into your bylaws specific protections uh, for stakeholders other than just your shareholders. So the planet, your neighbors, these kinds of things. So um, it becomes something that could be legally defensible if someone were suing you for not optimizing for, for stakeholder return or share investor return. You can say, well, I also said that I, I represent these other stakeholders too. Um, so it's a really important thing. Um, you can see some of the kinds of businesses that are up there. Um, Etsy's no longer B Corp. That's another interesting story that's uh, maybe for another time, or we can talk about it. Um, but uh, we did that. Um, here's an example of the kinds of projects that, that came out of the Values and Impact team. So uh, an initiative called Etsy Solar, where we helped provide financing and reduce costs for Etsy businesses that wanted to do on-site renewables. Uh, we calculated a social cost of carbon and actually created our own carbon tax uh, based on the shipping emissions um, from our marketplace, and then try to essentially claim the offsets by supporting the creation of more renewable energy. So really trying to look at different ways that we could use business to actually um, get us to where we needed to go. Um, this is the mission of Etsy, or was the mission at the time, and I think about this mission uh, as really finding its roots back in that Bill McKibben book, because uh, Bill McKibben wrote something in that book that uh, has always stuck with me. And he said, uh, the key question is whether the economy uh, will, what was it? <laughs> it's always stuck with me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the key question is whether the economy uh, will produce an ever larger pile of stuff or build or undermine community. Because community, it turns out, is the key to satisfaction, uh, it's our key to satisfaction but also our key to survival given our current uh, ecological predicament, um, something like that. 
And <laughs> yeah, got it. Uh, so that's what I think the reimagination of commerce is, is building community, not selling stuff. Um, and so how do we do business in a way that makes a world that's more durable um, from an ecological and economic point of view, but also more joyful, and more connected, and more fun? Um, just like if you go to downtown York, it's a lot more fun than going to you know, a strip mall in wherever, right? It's so much more vibrant. There's so much more going on. Uh, and so I really wanted to figure out how we could develop a marketplace and a business that wasn't just trying to compete on price and convenience or even playing in that game, but focusing on meaning and connection. I think a lot of the problems that we have in the world right now are all about, you know, we value price and convenience more than uh, a lot of the, the side effects of that, you know? Um, and I think about, you know, uh, I'm not a fan of Amazon. Um, and I think that it is really convenient, and it's often much cheaper, but there's a, there's a consequence to that, and the consequence is, is, is what happens to our main streets and our local businesses. You know, there is a consequence to having any item shipped to you in two days, no matter the size, right? That comes at a great ecological cost. Yes, it's more convenient, but we're not actually really factoring in what it is doing to, to our planet and to our communities. Uh, and so I really wanted to figure out how can we use business as a way to actually maximize that human connection and that connection to our place and our connection to uh, our communities and neighbors. Um, and uh, so I went to Oberlin College and I was fortunate enough to have a professor there named David Orr, uh, who is another person I recommend uh, reading if you get the opportunity. Um, so in, in 2015, um, Etsy went public. Uh, we got, became publicly listed on the stock exchange. Um, that's uh, another interesting story that I can talk about, maybe when, maybe when the cameras aren't rolling. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that being public isn't bad in and of itself. It's just that I feel like the financial system is broken. Um, and the people that benefit from it really are the big banks and not necessarily the opportunity to democratize ownership in something. Um, but uh, Etsy tried to do it in, in ways that I think were really different and unusual by limiting the amount of stock that people could buy, by um, being a B Corp, the first public B Corp and the only public B Corp. Um, you know, but at the same time, it's still part of a system that is inherently broken in my mind. Um, and so one of the other things that Etsy did that I think was so powerful was we said, okay, well, here's an opportunity to create another entity um, that can further that mission of Etsy in ways that are different from how Etsy's doing it. And so I, I was asked to figure out what that should be. Um, and I said, well, if we're trying to change business, we need to change business education because, you know, we're, we're teaching people the wrong kind of success. Um, we need to cultivate that different view of success. Um, and uh, so I presented this concept to Etsy's board. They agreed to uh, create this separate entity and give it some Etsy stock to get it going for the first few years. Um, and then they asked me to become the executive director of that new organization. And so in 2015, I left Etsy uh, and went to Etsy.org, uh, as it was called then. And the idea was to build an online business school that would help, you know, create successful people in this David Orr sense, this different kind of success. Um, and so I started, you know, again, I want to recognize the irony here too that, that like I'm building a business school uh, just because I was an art history major, a screen printer, and in, in a band um, before Etsy. So, you know, but somehow I'm the guy for the job. Um, and I wanted to, you know, think about uh, what are the books, what are the experiences, what are the ways of learning, what's the content, what's the wisdom um, that can help us uh, work in these different ways. And um, so I set out to build this, uh, what we called Regenerative Entrepreneurship Program, catchy name. Um, I'm just kidding, it's not catchy. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, piloted the content um, with a group of, of businesses in, in Brooklyn. And the idea, again, was that it would be placed online. And in that process, I had kind of two major realizations. One, um, that despite our, our best intentions, 
I really felt that we were just kind of trying to teach people how to do business in less bad ways. That we weren't actually really looking at what the world was calling for, that we were just saying, oh yeah, you know, you can do well and do good. And I think that there's some truth in that, but I do feel like we need to push ourselves to go farther, that we can't settle for less bad, given just the incredible you know, inequality and inequity and, and ecological degradation that we're, we're facing right now. I mean, the food waste thing, just, you know, uh, just that is preposterous. You know, here's an interesting fact. If food waste were a country, it would be uh, the third largest greenhouse gas emitter, just food waste. Anyways, it's completely uh, broken, right? <laughs> uh, it'd also be the largest user of water. Um, in any event, um, sorry, see, I'm digressing now. Thank you for the, thank you for the time warning. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I realized that I didn't want to just build this, this online thing, and what I felt like was really what was being called for was something that was rooted in place and something that wasn't on the internet, there was something that was in person. Um, because at the root of the challenges or the problems that we're facing in my mind is disconnection. We're disconnected from ourselves, we're disconnected from nature, we're disconnected from our places and our communities and our neighbors, and how are we gonna reconnect so that that shift can happen, that consciousness shift, where we're actually realizing, again, as, as David Orr is saying, is that our success is shared. And that success isn't what we're talking about you know, when we look at, at, at Mark Zuckerberg as the pinnacle of success or Jeff Bezos. Again, I don't know these people. They might be great people. But I think we should aspire to be more like Judy Wicks, you know, to be people who are looking at the success of their community when they, when they do business. Um, and so I um, wrote another letter uh, to the board basically saying, um, I think I don't want to do what we plan to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I instead want to focus on, on really community building in place and can we essentially and with uh, love in every direction part ways from Etsy uh, and strike out on our own. Um, and they agreed. And so Etsy.org became the Good Work Institute. Um, we transitioned from being a private foundation of Etsy to a public charity and we placed ourselves uh, in the Hudson Valley where Etsy had been operating for many years. but. Um, where I felt, in a lot of ways, like York, there's so much potential. There was so much stuff going on, and I thought that we could actually be really helpful in supporting that right kind of community-based economic development or ecological development or regeneration, whatever you want to call it. Um, so this is the Hudson Valley. There's the Hudson River. Uh, and our mission, uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, is to educate and connect a network of local community members and then actively support their collaborative efforts to regenerate their places. So very much like what this is tonight. You are all doing that. You are community members. You're building the network through your it and through all of, the, uh, all of you all who are related to that. And you're actively supporting these efforts to regenerate place. And that's actually what we need. To me, you know, uh, it's so important to recognize that the solutions are here already, uh, that you don't need some big thing to come in and save you. you don't want to wait around for the federal government to come save you. What we need to do is come together in community and begin to become the authors of our own communities, of our own futures, and actually build one that include everybody, and that actually think about the impact uh, that we're having, positive and negative, with the choices that we make with the work that we do. Um, so this is what we do, um, and uh, this is where we work. Um, here's some beliefs, and I'm going to get through this quickly. Uh, uh, I believe fundamentally that the system is broken and also fixed. <laughs> I, I didn't come up with that. But meaning that it's also st it's stacked against a lot of people. So how do we begin to just accept the fact that the way that the things are generally going, and there are exceptions, uh, is just broken? And stop trying to just tinker with a broken system and really begin to say, how do we build something new that actually works for people on the planet? Um, I believe that the future will be built from the ground up. So, like I was saying, you know, in the, in the Hudson Valley, it was IBM that was the big employer, and they left, and then there's been, you know, 30 years of how do we get IBM back? And I think that's the wrong question to be asking. Um, you know, what we need to do is build that future ourselves. Um, I think that there's no silver bullets. Uh, what we need 
like a healthy ecosystem is a big number of small things, a big number of these little initiatives that are gonna actually shift our future. Um, and I talked about that. Um, I think community is the answer, actually. That's really what we're building. So both resilience, how do we survive in this current um, economy, in this current system? Um, it's gonna take working together. It's gonna take community and how, and that's, that's the resilience piece. Uh, I think, you know, with uh, ecological crises growing, what's gonna matter is community and relationship and taking care of your neighbors and one another. I also think that that is how we're going to develop that more regenerative future, is that the community is going to build it together. Um, so what we're doing is trying to build this bioregion specifically uh, here in the Mid-Hudson River uh, estuary watershed. Uh, I think we need to begin to think bioregionally, so we're not just looking at government lines, but saying, actually, you know, what happens to this river affects uh, Duchess and Ulster, regardless of who their elected officials are, um, because we get our drinking water from there. So we should be thinking together about the choices that we make. Um, the other thing is to begin to offer support without, without using the tools of the old extractive economy, but moving us much more to, towards this different way of being and working. And I think that that's also really, you know, with collaboration at its core, not competition. Um, so what we actually do, we run a fellowship program, six-month fellowship for people working in the Hudson Valley. We just finished our fourth. Uh, we run workshops and classes on these subjects. Uh, we have a space in Kingston, New York that's there just to support collaborations. So we have conference rooms, all sorts of shareable resources, uh, lawyers, accountants, these kinds of things that come in to support the people that are doing the good work. Um, and we're developing a, a gap year program with local high schools with a focus on climate and ecology and a service year like the Peace Corps, but instead of going away, you're working in your own place to make it better. Um, and we're basically here to help people do good work. So the last thing I will leave you with is um, we tried to define what it is to do good work. Um, it's a very hard thing, and it's also very particular to each person. So this is just my attempt. Uh, because everyone's like, well, what do you mean good or what is good work? Uh, what's regenerative? And it's all, it's all relative. And it's also, I don't mean good and this is good and this is bad, but good in that kind of Wendell Berry sense of like work that actually knows and honors people and places. Um, so these are the, the principles of good work as we've articulated them. Uh, good work honors nature. It recognizes that we're not separate from the natural world. So it's, it, it goes beyond sustainability. I don't think we want to be sustaining what we have right now. We want to be making places better than they were. We want to make them healthier than they were, not just look at the natural world as, as a resource, uh, but as actually something with which we are interdependent. Um, good work builds community. So we've talked a lot about community. I think that that's pretty clear. Uh, nourishes our full humanity. So I love this idea of, you know, I think for so long, work has been this thing like, oh, I got to go to work. But how, as, as employers, um, you know, as workers ourselves, how do we engage in work that, that, you know, nourishes us physically, mentally, spiritually, and brings us together in community, and it can be so beautiful that way. So uh, we use these as our values. How do we create nourishing work? How do we give oppor opportunities for people to share their gifts uh, in the work that they're doing? Um, embodies integrity. Uh, I love the word integrity because it speaks both to the ethical and the structural nature of something, right? If you build something that collapses or, or is uh, my kid, one of my kids wanted, it was like some light up nose, uh, you know, for like Rudolph nose. And I, in a moment of weakness, I bought it for him. And then uh, the batteries ran out and I was trying to figure out how to change it. And there's like, oh no, you can't change the battery. It's just, it was meant to last for about a day and then be thrown out. I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> You know, so that lacks integrity in my mind. Um, but also, yeah, how do we build something that really um, has, you know, isn't exploitative or extractive in any way? Um, how do we recognize the inequity of our system and actively work in ways that aim to right that? Um, and I think that that's just something that's, you know, we have to be building into every decision that we're making in the work that we do. Um, how do we grow appropriately? So this is, uh, I love uh, the idea of appropriate growth. I think, again, Judy's a good example of that. E.F. Schumacher writes about appropriate technology. What is the right amount of growth that's appropriate? Um, 
in my mind, you know, growth isn't bad necessarily, but growth just for the sake of growth is a problem. When you're not recognizing the, the damage or whatever it is that you're causing with that growth. Uh, I was mentioning to somebody the Wendell Berry essay, It All Turns on Affection. To me, that's the perfect example of, uh, of writing about what is an appropriate growth. You know, and it, when you become too big to recognize the impact that you're having on communities, then you're probably too big. Um, you know, an appropriate growth would be about creating value uh, and creating benefit for everybody who's touched by that growth. Uh, and finally, uh, leave room for the mystery. Uh, at an earlier meeting today, we wrote a lot about emergence. Um, I think that, you know, we shouldn't, we should expect that there's more than we can understand or quantify. Uh, and, I, you know, I think about that a lot with, with a place, right? Uh, York has a lot of essence that's very hard to describe. It's just part of that place. And that's part of the mystery. And if you try to, like, define it or control it, you kill it. So how do you just leave room for that mystery and for that emergence and recognize that we need to stay open and stay curious and, um, yeah, have some humility that we, really, you know, that we don't have all the answers and that there's bigger things at play. So with that, uh, I'll stop. Thank you very much for having me. And, uh, yeah, glad to be here. Thanks.